Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming again. I feel like you're all my friends. And I have met a lot of you through the course of the cruise. Well, today we're moving out beyond the solar system. We spent the first six talks talking about our solar system, and hopefully it gave you the idea that there's a lot more to the solar system than you were ever taught in school. Well, there's a lot more to the rest of the universe, too, that goes beyond the solar system. And so what I'm going to talk about today is other stars and their planets. Now, up until recently, we had no idea whether other stars had planets or not. We knew that the, su the sun had planets, but maybe there's something special about the sun. Maybe it's unique in some way. I mean, we certainly seem to think that we're unique in some way. And so it wasn't until fairly recently that we were able to determine that there actually were planets around other stars. Now, you might wonder, how in the world could we do that? Because the stars are really far away, and the only reason that we can see them at all is because they're very bright. They're a nuclear furnace burning brightly, and so we can see them. But any planets that would be around them, they're not burning, you know, they're just reflecting the light of their stars, which is pretty dim. And as we have talked about our solar system, and we've talked about seeing Mercury and Venus and Jupiter and Saturn and Mars, those, all, all of those planets were seen by the ancient people, and they could see them with the naked eye. But as we got farther away, we needed more and more powerful telescopes to see Uranus and Neptune, and then finally Pluto and the rest of those Kuiper Belt objects and scattered disk objects like Eris. And so considering that those planets are relatively nearby, they're orbiting the same sun that we are, how in the world could we expect to be able to detect planets around other stars that are light years away, or tens of light years away, or hundreds of light years away. Well, there are five different methods that we have been using so far to find planets. One of them is called the radial velocity method, and then there's the wobble method, the transit method, the microlensing method, and direct observation. And I'm going to be talking about all of those so that you all understand them. OK, great. How many of you have ever been to an automobile race? OK, quite a few. And have you ever noticed that when the race car goes by, because it has a powerful engine, it makes a loud sound, right? And as that racing car is coming toward you, you can hear it. And as it's going away, you can hear it. And the sound is like this. Wee right? Am I right? It makes that sound. So as the race car is coming toward you, the sound it makes has a higher pitch than the sound it makes as it's going away. That's called the Doppler effect. And I want to demonstrate the Doppler effect to you so you really understand it. I need one volunteer. Can I have a volunteer from the audience? OK, this gentleman right here. Al, come on up. Come on over here, Al. Tell the people your name. What's up? 
Go ahead. I never saw you before in my life. Oh. Okay. Well, stranger, <laughs> do you know what this is? Yeah, I what? forgot the name of it. You forgot the name. Does anybody know what the name of this is? Slinky. Slinky. It's a Slinky. Oh, a Slinky, yes. Yeah, you knew it was a Slinky. Okay, Al, I want you to come over here. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Stranger. And take, it, take that end of the slinky, right? And I'm going to take this other end over here. OK. Now, can you people see the slinky? All right. Now, each one of these coils represents a wave. And if we were talking about starlight, it would represent a light wave. But it could also represent a radio wave or a sound wave or any other kind of wave. Right? Now, right now, this wave is kind of at what I would call the normal frequency, the wave or normal wavelength. Now, watch what happens as I approach that strange man over there. Did you see what happened to the frequency? The frequency got higher and the wavelength got shorter, okay? So as I was approaching Al, if this were a sound wave, it would be wee, it would be high. Now, okay Al, come over here. And now, hold on, hold on, hold on, okay, now, I'm, I've passed out and I'm going away. <laughs> Thank you, Al. Let's give out this strange man a hand. So that's the Doppler effect. I need two volunteers. Can I have two volunteers? I, I see one person getting up. I see two people getting up. Great. Come on up. I'm dropping my cookies. Yeah, here. Yeah, you lucked out. Okay. Thank you. So, what is your name, ma'am? Mary Lynn. Mary Lynn. Okay, thank you, Mary Lynn. And? Jean. Mary Lynn and Jean. Okay, Jean, you, you are the lucky one. You are the star. So. You get to be right here in the center of the stage with that star there. And Mary Lynn, you can come over here. Okay. All right, and you can hold this up this way. All right. Now we're going to assume that the orbital plane of this planet is exactly on a line with the Earth. And sometimes it is. All right, now you're going to. Mary Lynn, you're going to orbit Jean, okay? So let's go around here like this. Okay. Stop. You're doing, no, no, you're doing great. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right, you've made one complete orbit. Good. Now, this, you know, I think I want to use a smaller planet. Where's my other planet? It rolled, oh, here it is. Yeah, I'll trade you here. Take this one. Because it, this model of the sun is way smaller than it should be. So imagine, imagine that this is really a really small planet compared to the sun. Okay, now, right now, at this point, you out there, you're astronomers on Earth with a telescope, and you see the light from the sun. And you also see, okay, just hold it like that, Marion. You also see the reflected light from this planet. This, this side over here is dark, but this side is light. And so some of that light you see, okay? Now, as 
Really? Around. As Marilyn goes around now, now, now right here, she's now in front of the star. And so she's blocking some of the light from the star. And all you see is the unlit face of this planet here. So it's like a black dot on the face of the star. And as she continues around, it stays there. And then finally when she moves off, okay, now you can see the full light of the star again, but you can see only the black face of the planet. But as she moves around, more and more of the planet become illuminated until she gets here, and then you can see quite a bit of light reflected from the planet. And then as she moves around here, almost the whole, here, stand over here, Marilyn. Okay, almost the whole face is adding to the light that you can see. So you can see the light from here, and you can see the light from here. Okay? All right, thank you, both of you. That was great. All right, so that explains that explains what we see here, right? Where it's a little bit, we get a little bit more brightness here and then less and less and less until the planet goes in front of the star and then we get a big drop in brightness and then when it comes back, then we, we still see all the brightness, of, we see all the brightness of the star again, but we're getting minimal brightness from the planet and then as the planet orbits around, we get more and more brightness from the planet. And then when the planet moves behind the star, there's a dip in brightness because we're not getting any reflected light from the planet anymore. So there's two minima. There's the big minimum and the smaller minimum. The big minimum is when the planet goes in front of the star and the smaller minimum is when the planet goes behind the star. So that is the transit method. And we've discovered a lot of planets using the transit method because that is the method that the Kepler Space Telescope uses. When the Kepler Space Telescope was launched, it looked at a patch of sky, basically just a random patch of sky. And in that patch of sky, there were 150 stars, no, 150,000 stars that it was looking at. Just a little, little teeny piece of sky, 150,000 stars that it was looking at. And it just stared at those stars for three years. So if anything happened to the brightness curve, it would, it would notice it. It would, it would take that data. Now, this is a lot of data for astronomers to, to go through. In fact, it's too much. And so what they did was they said, you folks out there, you want to help with astronomy? Would you like to discover a planet? Well, you can. And so an organization, a nonprofit organization called planethunters.org, planethunters.org, was given access to the data that came in from the, Kep the Kepler Space Telescope. Hmm. And here's one of the scenes that came in from the Kepler, Kepler Space Telescope. And you can see that uh, there, are, there are a bunch of set of data sets here, and this one happens to be data set 14.1, okay? And you can see this noisy thing here. This is the brightness of the star. But look at this. There's a dip, and there's a dip, and there's a dip, and there's a dip. And, and the dips are, are kind of the same depth. And there was a data loss there for some mechanical reason. And then a dip, and a dip, and a dip, and a dip. Something is transiting this star, and it seems to be transiting about every three days. In other words, a planet that is very close to the star. Now, this just happens to be a data sheet from planethunters.org that I found the planet on. But anybody could do the same thing. You don't have to be an astronomer to do this. All you have to do is notice the dips. Oh, yeah, now, the microlensing method. 
This is kind of an amazing method here, and this is a very confusing slide. So I need some volunteers. I need, th I need three volunteers. Can I have, can I have house lights so that I can see volunteers? There, yes, I'll take this gentleman right here. And do I have another volunteer? Looks like I do. There's two. I need one more. Okay, sir. A bold man for sure. Come on up. Oh, he's not a volunteer. He's going to the restroom. <laughs> Can I have another volunteer? Okay. All right, great. You guys need stars. Here, have one of these. Thank you. And you guys play soccer? Pick, a, pick up a, one of those. Okay, here we are. All right, what is your name, sir? Michael. Michael. Okay, Michael and? Joel. Joel and? Joe. Michael, Joel, and Joe. It sounds like a, you know, kind of a folk and rock group. Um, okay, come on over here to the center, Michael. Michael, Joel, and Joe. All right. Now. Joel, I want you to stand behind Michael and hold up your, yeah, that's good, hold up your star there. Well, it should be at the same height for, for both you guys. And Joe, you're over here, that's fine. All right, now, I want, in fact, come over, come over this way, Michael. No, you stay there. All right, now, all right, here we are. This is good. All right, now, I want, I want to practice, all right? All right, so we're, what we're going to do is Joel is just going to stand where he is. He's not going to move. In fact, Joel, you have the easiest job. All you do is stand there. Okay. Now, you guys, we're going to walk slowly this way. Come on. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, great. All right. All right, now let's go back again. No, you're doing good. All right, now I want you folks out there to imagine what's going on here. Joel is a star that is really far away. In fact, it's so far away that it's totally invisible. You cannot see it at all, all right? It's really far away. Good, good one, good one, Joel. Step, step a little closer to the screen, Joel. There you go. And don't, don't fall down the hole there. Okay, now, you can't see any light from that star, but you can see light from this star, right? Now, well, you know, I talked in one of the previous lectures about the fixed stars, that if we could see the motion of the planets in our solar system, as they moved against the background of the fixed stars, because it looked like the, the stars weren't moving. But in fact, the stars do move. And the closer a star is to you, the easier it is to see that movement. If it's really far away, yeah, it's still moving, but because it's so far away, you can't really see that movement because the movement is not describing very many seconds of arc. Okay, so this star here, we can see the light of this star. We can't see the planet that Joe has. It's an invisible planet, okay, but it's there. All right, now, now Michael, I want you to move slowly this way. Okay, stop right there. Now, M Michael is directly in front of Joel. So what is happening? We know from Newton's law of universal gravitation and Einstein's general relativity that gravity attracts things. 
Newton figured it attracted apples, which it does. But Einstein told us that it also attracts light. And so the light from that from Joel's star, which is too far away for us to see, it's going out in all directions. It's going out in all directions, but some of it is going to pass real close to Michael's star on this side and on this side. Good, good work, Michael. And when it does, oh, and also this way, and every which way, what's going to happen? The light that would normally go off in these directions gets bent by Michael's star so that it all comes together and converges at a focus. And you know what's at that focus? A telescope. And so the light that is too dim to be seen from Joel's star gets focused by the gravity of Michael's star and now it's strong enough to reach our telescope on Earth and we can see it. Now, I've just described everything with Michael just standing there. Now we'll go back to what we did in the beginning. Come over here, Michael. All right, now Michael and Joe, you're going to work together here, and we're going to go across the face of Joel's star. Oh, beautiful, great. Okay, that's it. Now, the light coming from Michael's star, we have very sensitive instruments looking at that. And so we see as the star moves across there, we see the light from Michael's star. And then all of a sudden we see a spike where the light from Joel's star adds to the light from Michael's star. And then, Joe's planet here, which isn't giving off any light at all, except a little bit, piddly bit of reflected light from Michael's star, but it has gravity. And it concentrates the light from Joel's star too, and so we have a second spike. Okay? This is called microlensing because the gravity of the star and the planet act like lenses that focus light. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. That's, you've done a marvelous job. Thank you. Now I can describe this confusing slide. Okay, what we see over here on the left is the source star, which is Joel's star. And here we see the lens star, which is Michael's star, and the planet, which is Joe's planet. And here we have the telescope down here. At this point, the lens star is not lined up with the source star, and neither is the planet. But they are moving, and they're moving from right to left in this uh, picture here. And what we see when they move in the way, we see the light rays being bent by the star into the telescope. And we see the light rays being bent by the planet into the telescope. Normally, and, and so in the telescope, instead of seeing that source star back there, we see these distorted images. In other words, we don't see this at all. We see these distorted images. So we see multiple copies of the source star, but they're distorted. So it looks like the light is coming from here but it's really coming from here. It looks like the light is coming from here, but it's really coming from here. It looks like the light is coming from here, but it's really coming from here. And then as the near star and planet system move along, now the planet is no longer bending the light, but the star still is. And so instead of three images there, we have only two. And then a little bit later, the planet is moving farther away, the star is off center, and so this image is weaker. And then finally, when these two are completely past, then we see the source star again. 
I said earlier that it's so dim that you wouldn't see it. Sometimes it is so dim that you can't see it. Sometimes it's bright enough that you can see. So this curve here shows you what's happening here. You have a spike when the planet is lined up with the far star, and then you have a bigger spike when the near star is lined up with the far star. So that's the microlensing method. And with the microlensing method, you can see star, you can see planets that are farther away than other methods. The, the bad thing about this particular method is once those near that near star and planet system go by, they never go by again. So it's a one-shot thing, a one-time observation. And there's not a whole lot you can tell from a one-time observation, but you can tell, by golly, there is a planet orbiting that near star. OK, the, the, the final method of finding a planet is to actually see it. Instead of all these indirect methods of inferring that a planet exists, actually seeing it. Now, this is the hardest to do because the star is very, very bright, and the planet, which only has reflected light, is very, very dim, and the, the light from the star is going to wash out the light from the planet. Well, here's an example, though, and we see in this star, this star is called Fomalhaut, and it's about 40 light years away, and you can see this dark disk here. That's a mask masking out the light from the star itself, which would be here where the white dot is. And we see that there's a lot of stuff orbiting Fomalhaut. Fomalhaut is a young star, much younger than the sun, and it hasn't really coalesced into a, a solar system yet. But if we look here in this little box, and here's a magnification of the little box, we see that there's this bright point of light that was here in 2004, and it had moved along a little bit and was here in 2006. Let's move it along a little more here. And in 2010, it had moved along a little more. And in 2012, it had moved along a little more. So we have a pretty good handle on the orbit of that planet. And boy, that planet is really far away from its star because eight, eight years, it just covered a very small portion of its orbit around that star. But that's a direct observation. It's a planet, and we can see it. Here's another example. This is a, uh, a star called HR 8799. And we have discovered three planets around it. Here's planet B, which is that little dot there that you maybe can't see. Planet C, little dot there that maybe you can't see. And this was taken in 2004. In 2007, it looks like planet B hasn't moved very much. Planet C hasn't moved very much. And then here's one that, that was taken in a different wave band. And so the, the shield around the star itself that is a blank circle here, they've got this model thing instead. But you can see planet B looks like it hasn't really moved much. Planet C hasn't really moved much. But now we have a planet D that we can see that we couldn't see in these other images. So this particular star, HD 8799, has at least three planets that we can directly image. I showed you the Oort cloud before, and we can see the Oort cloud here around the sun. There's, there's the solar system, you know, all the way out to Neptune in that little dot there. And then here's this huge Oort cloud, which is anywhere from 100,000 to 150,000 astronomical units across. And here's the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, which is almost within range of that Oort cloud, right? The Oort cloud is coming over quite a ways close to Proxima Centauri, which is only 274,000 astronomical units away, equivalent to 4.21 light years. And just before this cruise left Southampton, the announcement was made that 
a planet had been found around the very nearest star to the Earth, Proxima Centauri. A planet has been found, and not only that, it is in what we call the habitable zone. And not only that, it's almost the same size as the Earth. So it's the best chance we have right now of finding a, a, a planet that is similar enough to Earth that people could survive on it, and that's close enough to us that we could conceivably get to it. It doesn't really look like this. We don't know what it looks like, but we do know that it's there. And here's a, a list of the closest worlds that we are, closest in terms of how close they are to the conditions of Earth. And we see that Proxima b there is in the number one spot. It is the most Earth-like planet that we have found so far, and we just found it. And you can see it has a, an index here of 87%. That means, as far as we can tell, it's 87% like Earth. And then here are some of the others. There's GJ667CC, which I showed you an example of earlier, and some of these others. And the sizes are relative, and they're compared to the size of the Earth here, the size of Mars, the size of Neptune, and the size of Jupiter. And this, on the other hand, rather than being uh, ordered by similarity to Earth, is ordered by uh, how close it is to the Earth. And once again, you see that Proxima b is the number one. It is the closest to the Earth, and it is the most similar to the Earth in terms of conditions. And so here are the other ones here. Oh, wow, is this exciting or what? There's a, there's a community of people, and I'm one of them, that is interested in spreading humanity to the stars. And we've been thinking for quite a long time about how we might do that, how we might get there. And there's been a lot of naysayers saying, no, no, the stars are too far, you'll never do it, it'll never happen. Well, one of us is a multi-billionaire named Yuri Milner. And Yuri Milner said, okay, I'm going to you know, draw a line in the sand and say, this is going to happen. And so Yuri Milner has committed to spend $100 million over the next 10 years to fund the beginning of a program to go to the nearest star. And the way to do that, let me go back to the first slide here. The way to do that is to send a probe now, you all are aware that our electronics has been getting more and more compact, right? We're packing more and more power into cell phones, for instance, or smartphones. The smartphone that most of you carry in your pocket is way more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer of a couple of decades ago. And so things are shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And although it would be very, very hard to send a big spacecraft that had people in it to another star, it would be a lot easier to send a very small spacecraft that had electronics in it that could send us back pictures and other data of that other star system. So this is called breakthrough star shot. And the idea here is that we would launch a laser-powered sail here into space, and this would be like mm, maybe 30 meters on a side, and you can see those light rays coming from the Earth. Well, those are from this array here of lasers, and all those lasers are firing and aiming at that sail, and they're providing tremendous, tremendous acceleration to that sail. No human body could possibly survive that level of acceleration. But our, hard, our space hardened electronics could. So what you do is you, you put that sail in orbit, and as it comes over the array, you turn the array on and fire it, and all those lasers hit that sail all at once, and it rockets away toward Proxima Centauri. After 10 minutes of laser 
power, it would be traveling at 20% of the speed of light, which is an unimaginable velocity. 20% of the speed of light. Now, Proxima Centauri is a little over four light years away. If you're traveling at 20% of the speed of light, in other words, one-fifth of the speed of light, then you are going to get to the vicinity of Proxima Centauri in a little over 20 years. In other words, within the lifetime of the people that launch it, it would then send back pictures and information, and it would take four years, 4.2 light years, for that information to come back to Earth. The, this array here would be flipped upside down, so to speak, not physically, but in terms of function. Instead of projecting laser rays, it would be receiving the signal sent back from the spacecraft. So in 25 years, thereabouts, you would have pictures and data from the nearest star. It would be a first step toward humanity wor working its way out into the universe. We've thought about the habitable zone in the past, that the Earth was in it, that Venus was too hot for it, Mars was just barely too cold. We have found since then that life can survive in a lot more places than we originally thought. We speculate that Europa, the moon of Jupiter, even though Jupiter is way out of the classical habitable zone, might contain life. That Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, might contain life in terms of the watery environment under the icy shell of those planets. And we found here on Earth that life can survive in amazing places, in caves underground where light never penetrates, at deep sea ocean vents under, the, under miles of water, under miles of ice in Antarctica, boiling hot springs, and under ice where no light penetrates. This picture was taken with artificial light in a cave where light never penetrates. Photosynthesis could not happen, and yet we have these slime molds living there and basically earning their living from the rocks that they cling to. These are black smokers under miles of ocean water, and you can see they're just covered with light. These giant tube worms there are also there in the, in the dark. This, this picture was taken with artificial light. There's no sunlight ever reaches this depth, and yet these things uh, are alive. Here's some bacteria that were discovered in an ice core that in Antarctica that was drilled down through miles of ice, still alive. Hot springs, like in Yellowstone National Park in the United States. Uh, there are organisms that live very close to the boiling point of water. And you can see the vivid colors here. Th those aren't rock colors, those are light colors. And even underneath Antarctic ice, you can see these animals clinging to the bottom of the ice pack. And once again, there's no, no light that ever reaches that area. So life is amazing. It finds a way. And maybe it has found a way on some of these other planets. So thank you very much.